There have been many situations in my life that could have been avoided if I had chosen to be an asshole, instead of being nice and well-mannered. It goes without saying that this situation would have been avoided if I had let go of the idea that I should always be polite. This is not a story of assault or life-threatening danger, but it was definitely creepy and in my mind, it could have escalated to something more serious. The situation went like this. I used to be very friendly with an elderly man and my neighbor. I felt bad because he seemed really lonely, as if he never had any company. At first, he would want to hug me every time he saw me, which I didn't think was strange, because hugging as a greeting or goodbye is very common where I come from. He eventually asked if he could have my mobile number in case anything happened and if he needed help. He told me he had suffered a stroke years ago and both he and his wife were prone to falls that would result in broken bones, so I gave him my mobile number. Whatever. I would want someone to help my elderly relatives if they needed help in an emergency. He would then frequently ring my doorbell to share leftover food with me, which I appreciated at the time. Then, he would come to my apartment almost daily and ring my doorbell until I answered the door. He once rang six times. He also once invited himself into my apartment when I opened the door and proceeded to remove his shirt to show me a scar on his chest. I told him that I believed him when he said he had a scar, and he really didn't need to undress. He took off his shirt anyway. If he did not see me for more than a day or two, he would call me to see where I was and what I was doing. By this point, when he would hug me, he would sometimes lightly bounce up and down or rock side to side. When that would happen, I would push away and tell him that I don't need a hug. I would make up an excuse like I had a cold or the flu. This was pre-pandemic and I did not want to spread anything to him. Shortly after this, three separate things happened on separate days that make my skin crawl when I think back on them. First, he put his hands on the sides of my head and gently squeezed. Then, he rubbed his hands on my hair and pulled my head towards his. I extended my hand against his shoulder and gently pushed away. I told him that I am not a touchy person and don't really like to be grabbed. This is true, and not just something I was saying at the moment. Second, he ran his fingers through my hair after I gently pushed away from his dancing hug. I told him again that I am not the type of person who likes physical affection. Lastly, he gave me a regular hug with no weird movements but then caressed my face with his hand and pinched my nose. I felt so uncomfortable and gross. I pushed away and told him that I had to get back to work. He slowly but firmly grabbed my arm and tried to initiate another hug. I pushed him away again and told him that I didn't need another hug. Each of these three things happened in my apartment not on the sidewalk in plain view of others. After that last encounter, I made the decision to never allow him within arm's reach of me again. I felt and still feel that his actions were gradually escalating. I did not care to let things escalate any further. When he would see me walking my dog and approach us, I would quickly walk the other way and not respond to him. He eventually realized I was avoiding him and followed me back to my apartment. He asked me if it was something he said. I was direct and told him that I do not like being touched, yet he insisted on touching my face and hair in ways that made me uncomfortable. He responded and said, I wish you said something about it. I did, multiple times. He still tries to talk to me when he sees me walking my dog, but I continue to completely ignore him. There are individuals who take advantage of certain assumptions younger people tend to make. I made the assumption that I should be unquestionably kind and social with this man since he was elderly and lonely. I made an assumption that my neighbor was just a vulnerable and frail person. I also made the assumption that nothing threatening would happen due to his fragile health, and I admit, it's entirely possible that I am just overreacting a little. But still, how does this pertain to being an asshole sometimes, instead of always being a well-mannered female? The truth is that I did begin to feel uncomfortable long before those three incidents took place. I felt uncomfortable enough to ignore him when he would ring my doorbell again and again. I felt uncomfortable enough to ignore his phone calls. I felt uncomfortable the moment he tried to give me that first dancing hug. Yet every time I chose to ignore that feeling of discomfort as it would have been seen as me being impolite to an elderly person. In those moments, I valued the optics of good manners more than what my gut was telling me. I will always choose to be kind to others, but going forward, 
I will be more alert and no longer choose appearing to be polite over my own sense of safety. My roommate and I recently moved to a new apartment. We're both female. She's 23 and I'm 22 and the location is simply amazing. The apartment is pretty nice too and the rent is doable. On one of the days we were moving, we met our across-the-hall neighbor, Russell. He came out shirtless to greet us and insisted that we would have to come over one day and try his homemade alcohol. Well, that day was today. I work from home, and my roommate goes to the office to work, so I was home alone. My doorknob is broken, so the door is always slightly ajar. I put in a maintenance request yesterday, so when I heard a series of knocks on my door, I assumed it was maintenance, and opened the door without checking, but alas... It was Russell coming to chat. Apparently, this man doesn't own a shirt. Everything was normal until he went into his apartment to get the alcohol and insisted on giving me a tour of his bachelor pad. It was then that I learned he was recently divorced from his fifth wife. I'm a people pleaser, so I said yes, but my gut was telling me no the entire time I was there. Keep in mind that he caught me off guard, so I'm also barefoot, slightly high, and I don't have my phone. Let me set the scene for you. Once I entered the apartment, there's a kitchen on the right, and then it opens up to the living and dining area. The kitchen was full of random jugs of green liquid. Instead of a dining table, this man had a full-size statue of himself, a folding table and a single folding chair. In the living room, he had the most casting couch sofa I've ever seen, an 85-inch TV held up by Home Depot boxes and three floor-to-ceiling framed photos of himself. He insisted on giving me a tour and... That's when I saw the bedroom. Red walls and a black and gold tufted bed rigged with lead lights and a red flag. It was really odd. He brought me back out to the living room to show me his YouTube videos and he gave me one of the cheapest, most trashy outfits I've ever seen in my life. Then asked me to model it for him. Ugh, to hell with that. I knew I needed to leave, but whenever I would move closer to the door, he would get in my way. I didn't have my phone, so I didn't know what to do. Eventually, he started asking me to have sex with him, and I thought to myself how easy it would be for him to take advantage of me in that situation. I was actually terrified. I did what any normal person would do and said that my mom was coming over so I needed to leave. He gave me a jug of the green liquid which had to be prison wine. Then he told me to come back later with my roommates so we could have some fun. I have to live here for 12 more months. What do I do? I am a 25-year-old female living in a relatively safe country with a low crime rate in Asia. This incident took place around five to six years ago, on one afternoon when my mom and I went out to run errands not far away from home and I was home alone. First of all, I live in an apartment block where there are a total of six units on each floor. The delivery man or salesman would oftentimes mistake my living room window along the common corridor as my neighbor's window. My neighbor's living room window is actually inside their house. I remember when I was in the living room scrolling through social media on my phone when I heard someone knocking on my neighbor's door. I looked out from my living room window which is sort of translucent due to being tinted. I saw two men based on their height and silhouette standing at their doorstep. One of them was shouting delivery. After knocking a few times, no one answered the door so they prepared to take their leave. At this moment, one of the men who passed by my living room window literally tried to peek in through a scratch on the window to get a glimpse of my house. Both of his hands were on my window with his face pressing on it and I saw one of his eyes. This scared the hell out of me. I immediately crawled onto the floor and went hiding in the room closest to the living room, calling my mom and briefly telling her what happened and asking her to quickly come home. After hanging up, I stayed in the room closely listening to sounds and occasionally sticking my head out to check if the guy was still there. I think about 10 or 15 minutes later, my mom finally came home. She told me that she had just run into the delivery man at the ground level lift lobby. Apparently, my mom was fuming with anger after listening to the full story, so she looked out of the kitchen window and actually saw that creepy delivery man looking up at our unit. She gave him a deadly glare before the man went into his van and drove off. After that incident, we would always cover our living room window with something whenever we were not at home to prevent people from peeking in again.
I live in a house with a medium-sized yard in it that's fenced in. If you go out the back door into the yard, there are some houses with backyards on the far end. It's a small complex, and it's basically five houses all squished together into one that shares walls on the right side of the yard and a street on the left. I've lived here for a few years and I've had no problems, but about nine months ago, this guy moved into one of the units in the complex. He seemed like a really normal guy, probably in his late 20s to early 30s, with nothing really notable about his appearance. He just looks like an average guy and things started out okay. But I've noticed in the past several months that he likes to stare at my house and family in a very creepy way from his upstairs window. The first time I noticed, I had stepped out to let my cat use the bathroom. She was a stray when I got her and preferred to go outdoors rather than use the litter box, so I kind of have to go out there with her. I usually just sit on my back porch and wait for her to come back up when she's done. I'm sitting there one night and I have this really unsettling feeling of being watched. I started looking around and I saw the dude up there in his window. He had the lights on and the curtain pulled back just enough so that I could only see the left half of his body while he stood up against the window just staring. The complex is pretty close, so I could see him clearly. I decided to brush it off, but turned off my back porch light anyway, thinking that maybe the light was bothering him. He turned off his light, and that was that. The next morning, I went out again to let my cat out, and I swear I felt his eyes glaring at me again. I looked up at his upstairs window, and sure enough, he was standing there in clear view, just staring at me, not moving. It's been this way for a while, where I'll need to go outside for one reason or another and I'll feel his eyes and he's there. He moves around, so I know he's not a mannequin or something, but he is always in that window, either sitting or standing. I've also seen him up there with a set of dumbbells sitting in a chair, working out while he watches us, and staring into my yard with an expression that's really blank but also wide-eyed. If I move, he turns his head and follows me with his eyes. He's always up there, day or night, and I can always see him because he keeps the light on at night. Mind you, I'm not just staring into his window. In fact, I try not to look at him at all. I can just see him out of the corner of my eye because everything is so close. I have a two-year-old niece whom I babysit on occasion and she likes to play in the yard. When we go out there, he watches her instead of me. This guy was super creepy. It's gotten to the point that I don't want to be in my yard anymore. Especially with my niece. I mean, with the houses being so close together, I've accidentally made eye contact with my neighbors several times before, but it's never been like this. Maybe I'm upset over nothing, but something about him really puts me on edge. Also, it's really strange to me that he never seems to leave that room, and his facial expression is just really strange. The best way I can describe it is that it looks like he's in a trance, but hyper-focused on us at the same time, or like someone who is mentally snapped. There's really nothing I can do about it except keep a close eye on the situation. One of my neighbors who lives in the complex told me that she can see him watching my yard when she goes out on her patio, and it really gives her the creeps as well. I always make sure my doors are locked and I don't let my niece stay overnight anymore. Any ideas on what I should do? This happened around the summer of 2000 in Midwest America, and I was a 12-year-old boy. I was shy and never did well with confrontation. Anytime I was scared, I'd feel myself shaking. Well, one day, my dad and cousin were weightlifting in the garage, and it was open. I then decided to grab my bicycle out of the garage and ride up and down the street while my dad and cousin lifted weights. As I was pedaling away from my house, I saw another kid riding his bike probably five to six houses down from mine, but he's just kind of going in circles. I get about 20 feet near him, but that's it. No words were exchanged, not even a wave or a nod. I just kept my head down and kept pedaling. On my next circle back down the street, that's when things got weird. I get near the area where the kid had been riding, and he's not around anymore, so I guess he went inside wherever he lived. Right as I'm about to turn around and head towards my house, which is probably like 80 to 100 yards away, I hear a man yell, hey, in an unsettling tone. I look up and a man is standing in his front doorway, probably 25 feet from me as I'm paused on the street with my bike. 
He's one of the creepiest looking dudes I've seen in my life. He had on a ball cap and he was wearing these thick Jeffrey Dahmer looking glasses. He had a tan, burnt orange, dirty looking wrinkled skin and had to be in his 40s. He looked straight out of a horror movie and he just had this sinister angry look on his face. He then says, If you say anything to my son again, I'm going to run your ass over. At this point, I was crying and frozen with fear, but then I started pedaling home faster than ever. I've never been in a situation like this in my life. I couldn't believe what happened because I never said anything to that boy. So I get to the open garage where my dad and cousin are still lifting, tell them the story, and they decide to go to this guy's house and address the situation that just occurred. My dad and cousin had a few beers and were pretty jacked, so they were ready to fight if needed. My dad goes straight to this guy's door with my cousin behind him and knocks loudly. The man opens the door and has this huge Rottweiler by his side, barking and going crazy at my dad and cousin. He threatens to let the dog loose, but my dad and cousin aren't cowering down one bit. After a bit of bickering for a minute, the guy goes inside his house and shuts the door. Nothing else happens that night and we walk back home. A few days pass, and now I'm about to get to the creepiest part. During the summer, when my parents worked during the day, my grandma would come over and babysit my little brother and I. We were about 10 minutes from downtown and my grandma was going to take us there to grab food at Sonic. We get in her car and start driving down the road towards the creepy dude's house. This made me feel uneasy, but that's the direction we had to go. As we get closer to the house, the hair on my neck starts to stand up again. As we go by the house, I see him. He's sitting in a red truck in his driveway facing the road like he's about to pull out. I don't remember well, but I think he might have even had a grin on his face when we drove by. We pass the house and he pulls out behind us. I started freaking out a bit, so I told my grandma the story about the man driving behind us. At first my grandma was chill about it, but then I noticed she seemed a bit shaken. This is because she had made about six to seven turns to throw him off our trail, but he kept following us every little turn. At this point, me and my brother were in the back seat with our heads down as he followed us, but luckily we made it downtown where it was busy. We got near the police station and took another turn. Then finally, he just passed on by. I never saw the man again. My mom and dad split up and we left that neighborhood two years later with my mom to move to the country. My dad still lives at the same house and I wonder if that dude stuck around for a while or even still lives at that house. What was his intent? Was it just a coincidence or did he plan on following us? It was so weird how it looked like he was just waiting in his driveway for us to pass by. So, where do I start? Well, let's see. There was the old hillbilly who'd always sit outside shirtless drinking a beer. This wouldn't have bothered me if my dog who loves everyone didn't freak out every time we walked by him. There was this one guy in the neighborhood I grew up in who got arrested for child porn and went to jail, but the one who personally creeped me out the most was this buff gym type guy. I thought he must have been on roids at the time. The guy looked like he could tackle a gorilla. He lived a floor beneath me in an apartment building. I met him and his friends at the building's pool and he hit on me and gave me a beer. Not really weird for a building mostly full of students though. He asked me about where I worked. Again, not a big deal except that a few days later, he showed up at my work to hit on me again. My little sister, who is much more shy and less comfortable with flirting, came to stay with me for a while. He hit on her too and gave her the creeps. A few months after all of this happened, I was walking the dog and came across a woman lying on the ground outside of the building. She was totally unresponsive when I tried to wake her up. I called 911 for her and the next day she came to my apartment to thank me and we talked for a long time. Well, it turned out the creepy guy had been her boyfriend and was physically abusive and she'd taken a sedative to calm down after a nasty fight. However, it didn't mix well with alcohol and she passed out while waiting for her friend to come pick her up. I was really relieved when that guy moved out. I'm a 22-year-old guy, but last year I had a bad accident that almost killed me. Since then, I sometimes have chest pain and trouble breathing for no reason. My arms and legs also shake on their own sometimes. I live in the countryside on a big property with lots of bushes and trees. 
I'm really cautious and don't trust strangers. Well, one night it was 1.30 in the morning and I was watching a movie on the couch while my parents were sleeping. My sister was out of town having fun when suddenly I saw a bright light outside that turned on because it sensed motion. The windows were closed, but the light was so strong that it shined through the gaps and the window blinds. Then I heard the back door making noise. I thought it was my sister returning from her night out, but she didn't come in for another 20 minutes. I asked her why she stayed outside for so long, and she said she had just gotten home. I thought it was probably the strong wind because there was a big storm that night. My sister and I went to bed in separate rooms. The next night at 1.15 a.m., I was in the kitchen making a sandwich which is connected to the garage. I should mention that my dog and cat sleep in the garage. Suddenly my dog started barking loudly and acting crazy for no apparent reason. I thought my dog was barking at the cat, but when he didn't stop after a minute, I got worried. I remembered what happened the night before. I was always anxious, so I went to get a knife because the guns were in the garage. Just as I was about to enter the garage, my dog suddenly stopped barking. I listened at the garage door for a few minutes, but there was no noise. I felt really scared, so I decided to go to bed. I planned to talk to my parents about it the next day, but they didn't take it seriously. Now it's the next night, and it's 1.46 a.m. I was half expecting my dog to start barking again, and I had my knife ready. And just as I thought that, it happened. My dog went wild again, barking like crazy. This time I hurried to the garage, and as I got closer I heard noises inside. I was sure someone was in there. I opened the door quickly, but there was nothing there. I searched the whole garage, but I found nothing. I told my mom about it because my dad was away on a business trip. I suggested we might need to call the police, but she didn't believe me and said I couldn't call them. I went back downstairs, thinking maybe I was going crazy, that it was all in my head. That's when I heard a whistle coming through the window. I rushed to the window and opened the blinds, but there was nothing outside. As I headed towards the garage, I heard a tap and then another whistle at the kitchen window. I quickly opened the blinds and saw that the motion sensor light was on. I went into the garage to get a shotgun, but it was empty. I searched for the bullets but couldn't find any. Then I realized that not only were the shotgun bullets missing, but all the bullets for the rifle, pistol, and revolver were gone too. I heard three taps on the garage door next to me, followed by another whistle and a laugh. Fortunately, I knew where my dad had hidden the spare bullets. I got the bullets from the secret stash which the person didn't find. When I returned to the living room, I heard more taps, whistles, and even laughter at every window. It was happening at the windows around the house, including the garage window. The person kept tapping, whistling, and sometimes laughing at every window. I rushed out the door with my gun ready. The person had disappeared, or so I thought. When I looked up, I saw a tall, slim figure in a hoodie on the roof. I was about to shoot when I suddenly couldn't breathe due to my health condition. I fell to the cold ground, aiming my gun at the person on the roof. But my body started shaking uncontrollably because of my condition. The person jumped down, and believe it or not, he put his lips right next to my ear and started whistling. I thought I was about to die. Then he walked towards my pool. After a few minutes, I managed to get back on my feet, using my shotgun like a walking aid because my legs were still shaking. I thought the person had left, so I went back inside and this time my mom believed me. We were about to call the police when we looked out the window, and we actually saw the person's head popping out from our pool. The police came and searched our property. They found all the missing bullets in our shed. There were muddy footprints all over our property, and to make it even scarier, the words, oh no, were carved into the wall. We also found out that he got into the garage by moving a heavy metal plate that blocked a hole to the outside. It was a complete nightmare. This person was whistling and laughing like a total maniac. I dare that motherfucker to come back so I can finish the job this time. My name is Mike, and I'm just an average guy living in a quiet suburban neighborhood. My life was pretty mundane, working a basic 9-to-5 job, 
watching sports on the weekends, and just trying to get by. Well, that all changed when a new family moved in next door. The Johnson family. At first, everything seemed normal. A couple moved in with their two kids, a dog, and a minivan. Well, it didn't take long for me to realize that things weren't quite as they seemed. The Johnson family kept to themselves, mostly. I rarely saw them go outside, and when I did, it was always brief. They would exchange pleasantries, nothing out of the ordinary. That is, until one night when I heard a commotion coming from their house. It was a regular Tuesday evening, and I was just lounging on the couch, flipping through channels when the sound of raised voices caught my attention. At first, I thought it was just a family argument. It happens to the best of us, but as the shouting continued, it became clear that this was something more. My curiosity got the better of me and I decided to investigate. I tiptoed over to my front window and peeked through the blinds. The Johnson's living room lights were on and shadows danced on the walls as the heated argument escalated. I couldn't make out what they were saying, but their tone was chilling enough for me to know that it had to be very serious. Just as I was debating whether to intervene or mind my own business, I heard their front door slam shut. I watched as Mr. Johnson stormed out. His face was a mix of anger and frustration. He got into his car and peeled out of the driveway, leaving the house in an eerie silence. Now, most people would probably just shrug it off, but something about that night stuck with me. Maybe it was the intensity of the argument or the fact that I had never seen such a heated altercation from the seemingly ordinary Johnson family. Either way, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. Days turned into weeks, and the Johnson's house remained quiet. There was no sign of Mr. Johnson, and the rest of the family seemed to be keeping a low profile. I figured they were dealing with their own personal issues, so I decided to give them space. Then came the night that sent shivers down my spine. It was around midnight, and I was just about to hit the hay when I heard a strange noise outside my bedroom window. It was a faint scraping sound, like someone was trying to be stealthy. I got out of bed and tiptoed towards the window with my heart pounding in my chest. I peered through the curtains and nearly shit myself. There in the dim glow of the street lamp, I saw a figure crouched by the Johnson's front door dressed in dark clothing and wearing a ski mask. The intruder was trying to pick the lock. Fear gripped me, but curiosity kept me rooted to the spot. I couldn't believe what I was witnessing a potential break-in right next door. My mind raced as I debated whether to call the cops or confront the intruder myself. As if on cue, the front door creaked open and the thief slipped inside. My stomach churned as I realized that this wasn't just any robber. This person knew the Johnson family. They even knew the layout of their home. My instincts kicked in and I dialed 911, whispering frantically to the operator about the unfolding situation. I watched as the intruder moved through the house. Their actions were deliberate and unsettlingly familiar. With the layout within minutes, the distant wail of sirens filled the night, growing louder as the police closed in on the scene. I continued to watch from my hiding spot, fearing for the safety of the Johnson family. The thief must have sensed the impending danger because, with a sudden burst of urgency, they rushed towards the front door. I held my breath as they made a hasty escape, disappearing into the darkness, just as the police car screeched to a halt in front of the house. Officers searched the property, flashlights cutting through the night. I waited anxiously, hoping they would catch the intruder and put an end to this nightmare. It felt like an eternity, but eventually, they emerged from the house empty-handed. As it turned out, the thief had managed to slip away leaving behind a house that felt violated and an entire neighborhood on edge. The police questioned Mrs. Johnson, and that's when the unsettling truth came to light. Mr. Johnson wasn't away on a business trip as the family had claimed. He was the intruder. Well, it turned out that the seemingly ordinary family harbored a dark secret. Mr. Johnson had been leading a double life, breaking into houses, stealing valuables, and maintaining a facade of normalcy during the day. The argument I had witnessed weeks earlier was likely a result of the mounting pressure and stress of his criminal activities. 
This revelation sent shockwaves through our tight-knit community. In the aftermath, the Johnsons disappeared, leaving their house abandoned in a chilling void in our once serene neighborhood. My name is Rhea, and my story begins with a new neighbor named Peter. When he first moved into the apartment next to mine, we quickly became friends. He seemed friendly and outgoing, making the effort to strike up conversations whenever we crossed paths. Little did I know that this person I considered to be a friend would turn into something far more sinister. In the beginning, Peter's company was enjoyable. We'd share small talk in the hallway, grab coffee, and occasionally watch movies at each other's place. Everything seemed normal, or so I thought. One night after a movie marathon at Peter's apartment, I began to notice some unsettling behavior from him. He became overly possessive, insisting on knowing my schedule and showing up at my place unannounced. I was alarmed after that and changed the locks, but that was just the tip of the iceberg. Things took a dark turn after that. I started finding notes with cryptic messages hidden among my belongings. The once friendly atmosphere turned into a constant state of fear. I knew Peter was behind it, but confronting him seemed too dangerous. One night as I laid in bed I heard the sound of someone moving around my apartment. I was terrified, and I realized Peter had managed to get in again. Without thinking, I grabbed my phone and slipped out through the back door, seeking refuge at a friend's place. The next day I decided to sever ties with Peter. I confronted him about his intrusive actions, but he played innocent, denying any wrongdoing. Determined to escape this toxic friendship, I distanced myself, changed my routines, and sought support from friends. But Peter wasn't ready to let go. He continued his relentless pursuit, leaving gifts and notes outside my door. The line between friendship and obsession blurred, and I felt trapped in a nightmare. One day as I returned home, I found my apartment in a mess. Things were scattered around, drawers were pulled out, and it was clear someone had gone through my stuff without my permission. It was a violation that pushed me to my breaking point. Fear turned into anger and I went to the police filing a report against Peter for harassment and breaking into my apartment. With the help of the authorities, I obtained a restraining order against him. The escape became a legal battle and Peter was forced to stay away. The process was emotionally draining, but it was a crucial step in reclaiming my sense of security. Moving forward, I surrounded myself with a strong support system and friends who understood the gravity of the situation. The court order served as a shield, allowing me to rebuild my life without the constant threat of Peter's presence. My name is Samuel, and up until a few months ago, I thought I had a pretty normal life. I lived in a quiet suburban neighborhood surrounded by friendly faces and white picked fences. It was the kind of place where everyone knew each other by name and we exchanged pleasantries over the backyard fence. My next door neighbor, Mr. Jennings, seemed like just another friendly face in the neighborhood. He was an older gentleman, probably in his late 60s with thinning gray hair and a slight hunchback. He always had a warm smile on his face and he'd wave at me whenever he saw me working on my car or mowing the lawn. I never had a reason to think twice about him until that one fateful night when it all started. Innocently enough, I was coming home late from work, tired and hungry as hell. As I pulled into my driveway, I noticed Mr. Jennings in his backyard tending to his garden. I gave him a casual nod and headed inside eager to kick off my shoes eat and relax. The next morning, as I sipped my coffee and glanced out the kitchen window, I noticed something strange. Mr. Jennings was standing at the edge of his yard, staring directly at my house. His smile was gone, replaced by an intense, almost predatory gaze. I felt a chill run down my spine, but I brushed it off as a trick of the light or a product of my tired mind. Days passed, and Mr. Jennings' behavior only grew stranger. I would catch glimpses of him watching me through his living room window, his eyes following my every move. Whenever I left the house, he seemed to appear out of nowhere, striking up awkward conversations about the weather or the latest news. One evening, I was working in my garage when I heard a noise outside. I peered through the window to see Mr. Jennings loitering near my trash cans. 
I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off, but I convinced myself it was just my imagination playing tricks on me. As the weeks went by, I became increasingly uneasy. It was as if Mr. Jennings had made it his mission to invade my personal space. I'd catch him snooping around my property. My friendly neighbor had transformed into an unsettling presence that really spooked me out. One night, unable to shake the feeling of being watched, I decided to confront Mr. Jennings. I knocked on his front door, my heart pounding in my chest. When he opened the door, he greeted me with his usual smile, but his eyes betrayed a cold, calculating look. Hey, Mr. Jennings, I've noticed you've been spending a lot of time near my house lately. Is everything okay? I asked, trying to sound casual. He chuckled nervously, his smile never faltering. Oh, I'm just admiring your lovely home, Samuel. Nothing to worry about. Hmm. I couldn't put my finger on it, but something about his response set off alarm bells in my head. I decided to keep a closer eye on him, and that's when I made a shocking discovery. Late one night, I was awakened by a strange noise outside. I peered through my bedroom window and guess who I saw. Mr. Jennings. He was dressed in dark clothing, sneaking around my backyard. My heart raced as I watched him approach my shed. Without hesitation, he picked the lock and disappeared inside. I knew I had to act quickly, so I grabbed my phone and dialed 911, whispering details about my neighbor's suspicious behavior and the break-in. As I waited for the authorities to arrive, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was dealing with more than just a nosy neighbor. When the police arrived, they caught Miss Jennings inside my shed and, to my horror, they discovered a stash of stolen items, tools, electronics, and even personal motos that I thought I had misplaced over the weeks. As they handcuffed him, Mr. Jennings glared at me with a hatred that made me really uncomfortable. It turned out that my seemingly friendly neighbor was a seasoned thief, preying on the trust of those around him. He had used his neighborly facade to infiltrate our lives, learning our routines and exploiting our vulnerabilities. The realization hit me as the person I thought I knew was nothing more than a wolf who was waiting for the right moment to strike. This is a short story, but it's definitely worth telling because it freaked me the hell out. Well, a number of years ago, a storm blew down a big section of fence between my yard and the house behind me. I went out to check the damage before work, and the neighbor from the house behind me came over. I had never met him before. He was a big guy in sweats, reeking of cigarettes and body odor with snot hanging from his nose. We started out talking about the fence, but it soon devolved into him telling me all about his lousy life, his nervous breakdown, his wife leaving him, his son getting married and pushing him away, and on and on and on. I had bigger fish to fry, I really didn't care what he had to say about anything in his life, honestly but all the while telling me all these things about his life. He was standing way too close to me, which of course made me step back, only to have him close the gap again. He was really persistent and it was starting to put me on edge. And so our dance began. He effectively ended up chasing me in slow circles around the yard for about an hour because no matter how many times I said I needed to go, he just wouldn't shut the fuck up. He was like an energizer bunny just yapping non-stop and standing close as fuck to me. I was too polite to tell him to shut the fuck up though and needed his goodwill for mutual fence fixing. He was well-intentioned but obviously mentally ill. The whole incident really creeped me out. I ended up paying for the whole fence repair because he had no money. For a couple years after that, he kept leaving food on my doorstep or in the backyard. He'd even sometimes throw candy bars over the fence. Again, well-intentioned, but super creepy. I was so relieved when he finally moved out. I had this crazy neighbor that I will be calling Crazy Paula. Just for context, my house is in a cul-de-sac, with my house being at the entrance and Crazy Paula's being at the very far end. This bitch was crazy. I remember when I was a child, she would become infuriated when me and my brother would play football outside our own house. Like, bitch? It's our own house. The fuck are you tripping on? We were a solid 100 to 150 meters away from her house. She called the police on us once when we were just 9 and 11. 
They showed up and laughed when they found out what was happening and told her not to waste their time. Come on, who calls the cops on a 9 and 10 year old playing at their own house? About a week later, we were outside playing again and we seen her getting into her car. We assumed she was driving out of the street, so we stepped onto the pavement. But nope, she gunned her car straight at us. We jumped out of the way and she went straight into the wall behind us. Then she called the police and said we made her crash her car. Can you believe this psycho? She got arrested after that and I'm pretty sure she ended up in a mental hospital or asylum because she was a total nutcase. We never seen her ass again after that. I lived in Center City, Philly when this happened and I was finishing my final semester at college. Our apartment shared a stoop with a guy who to this day, I never learned his name. I only saw him once, just at the scene. His house was a typical three-story townhome. We lived at Broad and Spring Garden, a block or two off. It's a decent enough area, not as scary as some of the city above us, thankfully. We have two Drexel College professors as our neighbors and above them in my building are lawyers. They had a typical three-story row home with a beautiful bow window that ran the entire height of the building. There were roughly 125 windows on the facade of the house, all of which we covered in tin foil, and in each window is a covered slit in the tin foil, so they could lift up the cover and peek through the slit if they wanted to see what was going on. Below on his door, the following was spray painted. Go away. Don't sit on the steps. Don't leave trash, etc. But every now and then, we would. The little slits open, especially on the main floor, and his eyes would just scan the area. We could hear him through our walls, constantly banging around his house, screaming about monsters and God knows what else. One time, and I literally mean only one time, we saw him outside cutting the tree branches from the tree in front of our homes, and he was standing on a ladder with a chainsaw for what could easily be done with a pair of hand cutters. He then jumped off the ladder at some point after throwing down the chainsaw and landed square on the roof of my car below, screaming about how it shouldn't be parked there. It was a perfectly legal spot. I parked there every chance I got. I was absolutely pissed the hell off about that and called the police. I ended up filing a police report and he got fined and had to pay for the damage he did to my car. We lived there for about a year before we moved out. I don't miss that area at all. One night, at 2.30 a.m., when I was around 12, I was walking home from the little play area at the end of my street and this random woman shouted and waved at me to come over to her house. She asked if I wanted to see her Lego models. I said yes and went into her house. Sure enough, she had the most amazing Lego stuff set up in her front room. Things like Star Wars ships built to a massive scale way before those Lego sets were a thing. I had a look at them and told her I liked them. I then left, and this never happened again, and I don't think I told anyone about it at the time. She lived alone was probably in her 40s, and didn't live on the street for very long. I had no idea what her story was, but if it had happened today, she'd almost certainly have been questioned by the police. Fast forward 15 years, and I moved into my new home. When I moved in, I quickly noticed I had an alcoholic as a neighbor, and she had a son who was about 18 years old. She seemed harmless, but was very loud. She was so loud that you could hear her ass from down the street, but again, she was friendly and harmless, so I didn't get too alarmed. However, the son seemed worried about his mom all the time, and with me being an empath, I worried for him. He used to tell me he didn't want his mom to drink, but then would go to the shop and buy her booze. At first, he seemed like a decent kid in a shitty situation. I remember thinking he was a bit of a creep when he caught me walking into my house one day with my shopping bags in hand. He asked me if I had seen some strange lights over the road from my house. Our houses overlooked fields and horse stables, but in the distance you could see the lights of the next village or town. There's a narrow road going down past these fields, so sometimes at night. My bedroom that faces that way gets lit up with the headlights of cars approaching. I gave all these reasons and explanations to him basically saying no, 
I hadn't seen the lights, but maybe it was one of them he saw. I just shrugged, thinking it was no big deal, and got on with my day. A few weeks later though, at around 10pm, I was startled by loud banging on my front door. Now I lived alone with a toddler at the time, so I would usually have ignored it, but I heard my name being called and I recognized the son's voice, thinking something had happened to his mom or god knows what. Maybe she had drunkenly fallen over or something. She did that a lot. I ran to the door and opened it. What's up? Is everything okay? He just stood there and stared at me for a few seconds, his eyes looking like he'd seen a ghost. Oh, thank god you answered. I know this is gonna sound crazy, but I had this crazy dream about an evil spirit in my bedroom, and it went through the wall that goes into your house, and I thought he was going to hurt your kid. I was worried and told myself, I just had to see if you and the kid were okay. Just keep an eye out, okay? And off he went, back to his house. Hmm, I thought that was strange, but thankfully they moved out a few months after that. I didn't know how much longer I could keep hiding from them whenever I spotted them when leaving my house. What a huge relief. When my wife and I moved into our house in the summer of 2019, the neighbors on either side of us warned us about the people renting the house directly behind ours. Apparently, they had been known to cause trouble and blow things way out of proportion, bordering on paranoia of everyone around them. We kept it in mind, but had no issues for the first six months or so after moving in. Their house sits on a hill behind ours, and so it overlooks the majority of our backyard due to the elevation change. Well, one night. Well, morning, technically. At about 3 a.m., we wake up to ring notifications from our phones showing video from our front doorbell. There's a man standing barefoot in a sleeveless shirt on our porch, pounding on our front door. We give it two to three minutes, just watching him on the app before doing anything. We were thinking, maybe he was some random drunk guy and had the wrong house. Essentially, giving him the benefit of the doubt. But then we start to hear him say, Come on out, you fucking pussy. I'm gonna fuck your ass up. He then leaves the porch and starts to head around the side of the house towards our backyard. Considering we had no idea who this was, my wife immediately called the police. I quickly got out of our bedroom and headed towards the external doors to look and listen for any attempt at a home invasion. At this point, our neighbors directly behind us throw a huge spotlight into our backyard from theirs. We're thinking, okay, cool. They must know something's up, and they're trying to help us out by shedding light on our backyard. The cops arrive several long minutes later and knock. We explain the situation, and they head out back to look around and get the scoop from the neighbors with the spotlight. Well, it turned out that the spotlight neighbor was the one on our porch. He had jumped over our fence into our backyard, and up into his yard, and then threw the light on. He told the police that several nights prior, I had let my puppy out into my own backyard in the middle of the night, and because I was in my boxers, he thought that I was trying to expose myself to his family, because they could look down on our entire yard from where theirs sits. He then followed this up to the police with evidence, which consisted of videos he had taken through our windows of my wife and I inside of our home, doing totally normal things like chores, watching TV, etc. Nothing inappropriate or out of the ordinary. Not that it would have mattered anyway. We were in our own home, minding our business. Because of the elevation difference, if they went out of their way, they could technically see through our closed blinds due to the angle. So they had been filming us for no reason at all and expected the police to see this as reasonable? The cops came back in and my wife was devastated. This was a huge breach of our privacy, of course, and totally unfounded accusations as we had never done anything to anger these people. For fuck's sake, we hadn't even met them. The police told us not to worry about it, that if he tries something again, just give them a call. I'm not gonna lie, this wasn't the most comforting thing to hear at the time. They moved out a few months later without any additional issues, and my wife and I celebrated like it was a holiday when we saw the moving van in their driveway. What a relief. Creepy-ass neighbors? Oh, this is my moment to shine. 
sit back, grab a snack, and listen to this crazy-ass story. I'm a female and was 30 years old at the time of this experience. I lived in a multifamily home on the second floor in a pretty wealthy town. My downstairs neighbor has been there for 12 years or so. He was a quiet single man in his early 60s with a dog. The first year or two I lived there, I had no issues with him. He was rarely home and didn't complain or cause any problems. During my third year living there, I started to notice a young girl was staying at his place quite often. She was maybe my age and I could tell they weren't related. I had no problem with him having guests. That is, until the intense arguments started happening. Constant yelling and fighting, furniture being knocked over, you name it. Then I noticed this girl was staying over even when my neighbor wasn't home and she's having people come over as well, and they're also fighting, partying, and just being loud and obnoxious. I was in law school, and the noise was not helping with my study schedule, so I was getting annoyed. One morning, I heard an intense argument and doors slamming, so I looked out the window, and one of the girl's guests was trying to break into the house. I guess she locked him out. She eventually let him in, and they left. Months went by of this weird shit going on downstairs and I started to feel unsafe. I ended up installing cameras in my apartment and at the front door that I shared with my neighbor. The camera catches random men coming to the house at all hours of the day to see this girl. What the fuck is going on? I thought. Sometimes my neighbor is home and sometimes he's not. I thought she was selling drugs or something because my neighbor was clearly using her at this point. One day, I went to get the mail, and a court summons arrived in her name. I looked her up and she had a long criminal history. A chill ran down my spine. The noise and sketchy shit continued until one day, she just disappeared. For like three months, my life was back to normal. She eventually came back and things got worse. Come to find out she was in jail for prostitution. Well, great. Now it makes sense seeing all those random men visiting her earlier. I complained to my landlord enough times and he finally told my neighbor that this girl was no longer allowed there. The cops got involved and they basically banned the girl from the house. Well, the girl's gone, but the neighbor is still fucked up on drugs and just generally being a piece of shit. I came outside one morning to find a scratch on my car. We share a driveway and shit happens, no big deal. I let it go until, a week later, I heard a crash in the driveway. My neighbor slammed his car into mine and crushed the entire front end. I go outside to confront him. What the fuck is your problem, old timer? He was so fucked up on God knows what that he didn't even realize he hit my car. Oh my goodness, I'm just pissed off at this point and wanted to scream at the top of my lungs. I called my insurance company and told them what happened. Well, guess what? On the same day, I came home from work and parked my already beat up car in a different spot so that he wouldn't hit it again. At 11pm that night, he crashed into my car again, despite me moving it, and completely totaled my car. I call the cops at this point because I had enough of this shit. He's so high on drugs and doesn't realize he hit my car both times. Nor does he come to tell me. He backed out of the driveway going like 30 miles per hour and didn't realize he smashed my car to pieces. Yeah, okay, whatever. Anyway, I moved the fuck out of there the following week. His insurance paid for the damage done to my car. I hope he got some goddamn help because he was a total druggie. Me and my fiancé rented a house that had another apartment in the basement. The lady who lived below us kept to herself for the most part, so we didn't see her much. Part of our rental was a detached garage, and she asked if she could put a small, deep freezer in our garage. We were using it for storage, so we were fine with it. After a couple weeks of having her freezer in there, it somehow got unplugged. She came to us and wanted us to pay to replace everything. I understood her frustration, but we hardly ever went into the garage since it was only for storage. In other words, we definitely didn't unplug it and our landlord agreed. But she was pissed. She had a son in college who came home for the summer. During that summer, he found a cat and brought it home. His mom said no cats were allowed inside, so he would feed the kitten outside. She was pretty wild. He left for school again in the fall. 
and we noticed that the cat was getting very thin. We started feeding her outside in her usual spot. Around Christmas, we bought a bag of cat food, and I made a plate of cookies and left them both at our neighbor's front door. The next day, they were both back on our porch. Rude. Whatever. We continued to feed the cat because she obviously wasn't feeding her. A few weeks later, the cat came to our door crying. She was trying to come inside. It was super weird considering she was pretty wild and we had never let her inside before. I let her in and noticed she was pregnant and, for sure, about to have babies. I made her a little corner and she had babies the next day. We let her stay in the house with us, but we knew we couldn't keep her. I went downstairs to talk to our neighbor. She said that her son's cat was a boy, so the cat we had obviously wasn't his. I posted on Facebook to see if anyone was interested in fostering a cat and her kittens because we couldn't keep her. Her son saw my post on Facebook and got super mad at his mom. She then called the cops and said that I stole her cat and lied to her when she confronted me about having the cat in my possession. It was the stupidest, most frustrating thing that had ever happened to me, as far as neighbors go. The police called animal control, who then contacted us. They asked us to take the cat and her kittens to the shelter so that if our neighbor really wanted the cats, she would have to pay the fee as well as get her vaccinated and licensed. We did take them to the shelter and, as far as I know, she did pay the fees to pick her up. However, I did see her on the animal shelter's Facebook adoption page not long after that. Poor baby. For the record, I was heartbroken to have to take her to the shelter. I felt awful for moving her and her babies around like that. I am sure that she was so anxious and scared. We would have tried to keep her, but we were moving to a new place that same week. Hence the urgency to find her a foster home, and we weren't allowed to have pets. All the authorities involved thought that she was nuts, and I think they were also frustrated to have to deal with this stupid situation. We had this creepy ass neighbor who lived in the apartment right below my husband and I. It went from constant complaints to him calling the cops on us multiple times and leaving threatening messages on our car and front door. When we first moved in, he was upset with the landlord for renting above him. He left plenty of unpleasant notes and interrupted quite a few times when we were talking to the landlord. When we moved in, we only had a mattress and no other furniture, but he kept calling the landlord saying that we were moving furniture around at 2 a.m. and had our TV on full blast. After the eighth complaint in two months of us still moving around furniture and TV being too loud, we finally showed our apartment to the landlord. We literally didn't have a TV and still only had our mattress. No clue what this guy's problem was. Then the neighbor started leaving notes on our car telling us to keep it down and he even put in writing. There needs to be no noise after 10 p.m. or else I'll call the cops. We usually didn't even get home until after 11 p.m. and... We were respectful to make sure we kept things down because we knew that not everyone had our work schedule. So we tried keeping it down even more and there were so many instances when we'd be eating dinner or cuddling quietly or even sleeping and he'd be banging on his ceiling, which was our floor. After a few months, he started calling the cops and it got to the point where even the cops told him to stop calling about a noise complaint because it's a landlord issue and every time they came, they never heard anything. The last time they showed up I was asleep and my husband ended up talking to them and explaining everything. They suggested that we file a harassment complaint. Then the cops showed up at the coffee shop I worked at at the time and explained that they were getting almost nightly calls. And they suggested to me too that we should file a harassment complaint against the neighbor. Well, unfortunately, things got worse. Our neighbors started leaving threatening notes on our car and front door and we kept hearing our doorknob jiggle. He claimed that he and a friend had sat outside our apartment for two hours and listened to all the noise we were making. He's a retired cop and said he will call in a few favors if we continue making noise. He knows where we park our car, so we better start parking it somewhere else, if we didn't want it to get damaged, etc. We kept the notes and made copies for the landlord and let him know that this was what we were dealing with, so we're just keeping him in the loop before shit started getting real. AKA, we're tired of this, and if an old guy gets his shit rocked, then just know that it's been a long time coming. The last complaint was when he ran outside to the landlord screaming that something needed to be done about us, 
because he heard our bed squeak the night before, and how dare he rent to some crazy college kids who are partying and having sex all night. The landlord finally told him to fuck off and stop being a bitter old man. Then the neighbor took a total 180, and we found out that he had decided to sue the landlord and was moving. Suddenly, the neighbor kept offering us rides when one of us were walking. He stopped complaining and leaving notes, but our doorknob kept jiggling and turning at around midnight, and whenever we would check on our door, we'd hear someone running down the hall as we'd approach our door. This is a real story that has absolutely traumatized me and my boyfriend. Two years ago, I moved to the UK for university, as I always wanted to go there and get away from my parents as the situation at home was beginning to become too toxic for me. In the first year at uni, I moved into a student accommodation and met some really great people. It was a good year, without meeting my boyfriend, who I'm still with and just enjoying my time away from my family and discovering what independence really meant. Anyway, as the second year came by, I decided with some friends to move into a house rented by student accommodations. But at least we had our own house and weren't restricted as much with noise and parties as living in a small shared flat like in the first year. Also, for reference, I had a ground floor room and my window gave into a very small backyard. I'd go out there and smoke every day as I am a smoker. There would be a very thin wooden door giving into the other side of the street where you would put your bins and broken chairs and whatnot. The door could only be closed and locked from inside the backyard, but since it was an old door, we had to attach some strings to keep it closed for good. I had neighbors on each side of the house, so we were surrounded by families and some other student accommodations. The neighbors on the right of us were five boys who looked way over the age of being in university. They were strange, so to say. I met one of them outside of our house one day because of a police intervention due to one of his flatmates attacking him and the others with a kitchen knife and burning their kitchen down. I heard some screams and so I went outside with my flatmates and saw one of them being covered in blood and cuts everywhere on his arm and a wound on his head inflicted by a kitchen knife. Me and my flatmates didn't know what to do so we offered him our help to clean himself and gave him an old t-shirt to change out of his bloody clothes. We then saw the guy who hurt these flatmates being escorted out by the police and into a van then driven off to be arrested. I don't know anything more about the story, the police didn't really tell us anything else. Anyway, the guy who we helped was quite weird. He said a lot of BS and kept trying to grab me and flirt with me. We noticed while helping him that he smoked quite a lot of marijuana, but just didn't really care at the moment as we just wanted to make sure he was okay as we didn't know him. Then after some time had passed, I would go to uni and come back home and see him quite often in the street, and just never said a word to him again. But one day, he came up to me in the street while I went to the corner store, and started talking to me weirdly. I didn't feel comfortable at all with that, for some reason. So I just didn't respond to him. He then just said, Oh, that's okay. I'll just wait in front of your house then, and we can talk further. Well, saying I was creeped out would be an understatement. I honestly just thought he was joking, so I bought my drink at the shop and headed back to my street, and as I turned onto the street where my house was, I saw him with his flatmate sitting on my doorstep waiting for me. So I panicked and went back next to the corner shop and called my only guy flatmate to ask him to open the door and tell the guys to go away. But obviously, he wasn't home and no one else was either. So I literally just waited it out until they left one hour later, and then sprinted back home and locked the front door. My front door had a glass panel on it where you would be able to kind of make out who was standing in front of it. After this already pretty scary encounter, I just tried to avoid the guy, and mostly succeeded for a while. But then, one day, as I went smoking in the backyard, I noticed that the wooden door, which is always closed, was open, and the strings that we put there to keep it closed were cut off, for whatever reason, I didn't think anything of it, and just closed the door again and put a new string on it, thinking it was one of my flatmates who took the bins out and just didn't tie it back. The weird neighbors would very often scream and yell and fight in their house, and it would wake me and my flatmates up in the middle of the night. But we kind of got used to it after a while. But one evening, my boyfriend slept over like he usually did. 
and he, who usually never ever wakes up because of a noise, woke up in the middle of the night because of a bang and some whispering. I was sound asleep, so he very silently woke me up, and we both just waited in the dark and listened for any other noises. Suddenly, we heard a loud bang noise coming from the wooden door. It was loud as fuck. The door just shot open and I heard some footsteps next to my window. I always had my window open because it would get really warm inside so we both just froze. Then we heard the door handle leading to the backyard begin to shake softly, as if they were trying to get inside. Then they stopped and it was quiet. Luckily we had the curtains closed so they couldn't see us, but we were ready to get dressed and get the fuck out of the room and lock them in if they came in from the window. Then we heard my window open and was almost halfway open. One of the guys was saying something in a different language that we couldn't understand while trying to get in. My boyfriend and I just shot up out of the bed, took my phone, and put clothes on. Then we both ran out of the room and out of the house. I then called my flatmates and told them to lock themselves in their rooms. Then, luckily the police, arrived in less than five minutes as the police department was only a couple of streets down from us. I don't remember anything else after the police came because I think me and my boyfriend were in shock. They ended up catching one guy, but the other guy fled and was later found a few streets up, smoking weed. The police told us they went inside of their house and found a shitload of meth and heroin. They were just carrying a massive kitchen knife with them. What the fuck? I was so confused as I've never done anything to offend, nor have I done anything wrong to my neighbors. So the idea of them breaking in with a kitchen knife terrorized me and my boyfriend, and God knows what intentions they had. The two guys ended up being arrested, and one of them was put in prison for two years for carrying a weapon with intent to harm. I'm now still coping with it, and finding it really tough to get over. To this day I ask myself periodically, what if? And what would have happened if? I now very often wake up because of the slightest noise and get horrible nightmares and PTSD because of it. But hey, at least I'm still with my boyfriend and we are okay. We often talk about it and it helps our peace of mind a lot.